Nordic cuisine. What is Nordic cuisine? There was Nordic cuisine before New Nordic, right? So the history of Nordic cuisine, five Scandinavian countries, um, the ingredients are similar to what we know now. Okay, a little bit different. Lots of the Viking era, lots of grains, root vegetables that they found in their travels and brought them back and started to farm them. Later on, grains. Okay, first barley and then later rye. Scandinavia is famous for rye. In Norse mythology, Andrimnir is, was the god of cooking. Okay, Andrimnir. Every day in Valhalla, he slaughtered the beast, Serimnir, which was a large, giant serpent, and then cooked that serpent in his cauldron for the rest of the gods to consume, and, he, and that provided their sustenance. And then uh, every night, that serpent would regenerate itself, and then the next day he would do it again and again and again relentlessly providing sustenance for the gods. Um, the, po- the theme of my lecture is pr- the pr- providing sustenance and the cycle of that and enjoying that process and finding balance in that whole process. So where New Nordic cuisine is... not that different from old Nordic cuisine, or what we're going to call it, okay? It's the joy of something from nothing, okay? The austerity of these ingredients, and similar to looking at a tree and understanding that tree is not only going to grow food for my family, but I can cut it down. It can provide warmth for my family, and my energy that I put into it is going to be the first thing in this cycle of giving everyone else in my family energy to do other wonderful things. Oops, let me go back to Nordic neurotransmitters. Now I'm moving really fast. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. Nordic neurotransmitters. Who knows what these are? Who knows what neurotransmitters are? Dopamine? Yes. Okay. Dopamine, you know, it makes you feel great. Nordic neurotransmitters. I, my favorite aunt, Auntie Gunda, um, she, ha- she got such joy out of providing sustenance. You could go to her house anytime, and she was there ready with some plate of cookies or some cooked ham. You could arrive at 2.30 a.m., and she would just be there in her Norwegian sweater with her tissue in her sleeve, just completely ready, okay? And... Um, I know my sister is here, and she's waiting for me to do my impression of Auntie Gunda. Um, Most of you know who Yoda is, okay? She she talks like this. I can't really do it that well right now. But um, it was always wonderful to to be inspired by her and her enthusiasm to feed everyone in her family. Nordic neurotransmitters. I'll go back to that. So what is New Nordic Cuisine? How many of you saw this wonderful exhibit here? Okay. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's similar to old Nordic cuisine, okay? Okay, I I just created old old Nordic cuisine. Um, It's really not different. That has been going on for centuries. And chefs in Scandinavia have been working in this same 
fashion for the last few decades. The New Nordic Manifesto, the New Nordic Food Manifesto, has put definitions around it and said, here's what we are all about. They've practiced those same things. Scandinavian cooks and people in their homes have practiced those same things for centuries. The ingredients are the same. Techniques. This is where we start to have some changes. So people like Rene Redzepi, okay, um, and Magnus Nilsson, where did they train to be chefs? They went to cooking school, and then they interned in France. The French have so many wonderful techniques and use many, many, many ingredients to prepare their food. Similar to Chinese, it's, the, it's that's um, the same style, not the same style of cooking, different, so many different techniques, a ton of ingredients. Strip those ingredients down, but use those same techniques, and you have more of new Nordic cuisine some of the plating, some of the austerity that reflects the landscape is what we look at when we think of, what I look at when I think of new Nordic cuisine. The improvements. I think the main improvement is that it helped us take a second look and, and put Scandinavia back in the light Scandinavian food, which is absolutely wonderful. The craftsmanship that it takes to take a beetroot and, um, you know, make wonderful things and take that beetroot and cure salmon out of it for an appetizer like they did tonight. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? So that's, that's craftsmanship, taking these things and making them work together and not overdoing it, not making it overwrought with too many ingredients. So the New Nordic Manifesto. Catch up on my notes here. The New Nordic Manifesto was developed in 2004 in Denmark by a group of chefs. They're listed out there, and there were many more people involved in this than just in that list. Um, they made it clear that Nordic cuisine can be compared with the rest, with the best cuisines in the world by virtue of its taste and individuality, but also in its quest for the quality and attractiveness that are to be found in other regional cuisines. Rene Redzepi himself said, New Nordic food is all about going back to the roots where food is produced with care and with a focus on taste and diversity. Forgotten varieties and breeds, old processing methods and new ideas in the kitchen. The New Nordic cuisine will be what we make it together. And with Nordic resources and cultural capital, we will do our part to contribute to a better world, a vision which now resonates from exclusive gourmet restaurants down to school canteens and private kitchens. Local dishes, regional varieties of fruit and vegetables, and national food traditions are gaining ground again, but with a new and stronger profile in an increasingly globalized world. People are searching for their roots to be better able to face the world. A 10-point manifesto outlining how to best develop this new Nordic cuisine. To express the purity, freshness, simplicity, and ethics that we would like to associate with our region. And I underlined our region because taking this, this manifesto and applying it to Oregon or the Northwestern United States, 
we live in a similar landscape. This is all about us here. It's not just about Scandinavia. Okay, this forces, forth, this forces us to think about food. and how we consume it. Where do we access our food? The farm, the supermarket, nature, all these things, all the above. Number two, to reflect the different seasons in our meals. We're, we're, we live in a place where the seasons are defined. We celebrate seasonal ingredients here in Oregon, okay? And holidays, okay? The Scandinavians, just like us, have holidays, but there's more to that. There's uh, coming up Fetisdagen, which is Fat Tuesday in Sweden. Midsummer, okay? Later on, Crofter, the Crawfish Festival, okay? Santa Lucia Day. Okay? And there are, are foods that coincide with these different holidays or celebrations. Okay? There are seasonal foods that go along with these. Traditions. Three, to base cooking on raw materials which characteristics are especially excellent in our climate, landscape, and waters. I know that Oregon is famous for a few different ingredients. Right now, the Oregon white truffle is world famous. It's the season for the white truffle. I was just talking to my friend Thomas on the, way, on the drive over here from Bend today about white truffles and what a great year it is. Uh, morel mushrooms, chanterelle mushrooms, hazelnuts. The list goes on and on and on. These oysters that we had tonight. Our geography plays a huge role in these. Okay, we're in, right now we are, what, an hour from the Pacific Ocean? Okay, where we can go and find some of the greatest food that Oregon has to offer. We can forage for things like seaweed. Okay? We can uh, dig for clams. We can, um, when it's in season, uh, go crabbing. Okay? All of those wonderful things. Fishing, hunting. We have so many natural resources at, that uh, play a large role in how we can eat. And the timing has a lot to do with it. Preparing. I was just talking to a few people, uh, my brother-in-law and my friend and my sister, about when are we going to, we need to plan when we're going to go looking for morels this year. Okay? You can't really plan that out. It's when the mushrooms are ready. That's when you go. Right? So it's all about the timing. To combine the demand for good taste with modern knowledge about health and well-being. There's a lot of words underlined there. Demand for good taste. We have evolved into a world these days where we demand good taste. Okay? The internet has helped with that. Television has helped with that. We watch all of these things where people are saying, this is delicious. You should try it. And then we go and look for these things. We hunt for these things. And if they're not in our, our local market or farmer's market, we ask them for it and say, I want this. And then suddenly, maybe a few weeks or maybe the next year, that appears. We demand good taste. We know, we know when something is not to, uh, in its prime. This is not good. I'm going to return it. I, you can do better. 
And we need to, we need to expect that of our food purveyors. We need to demand good taste. Modern knowledge, okay? We've gained modern knowledge to demand good taste. And health and well-being, we are eating healthier as a society. Oh my gosh, I just saw this wonderful thing for a kale salad. Kale salad. But if it's done right, it's delicious, right? I mean, I can't deny that. So we, we have, our lifestyle is based around these things. And I mean, I'm a chef and my life is based completely around food. I really can't deny it. It drives my wife crazy sometimes. I mean, I will be, we'll, we will be eating dinner and I will be talking about what I'm going to be cooking for dinner for the next, like the next day or a week later or something like that. And she's like, can you just concentrate on the meal that we're eating now, please? So, and I teach, I teach cooking. So it's, it's my world. It's my lifestyle. But, but for people who, who, who aren't chefs and are great home cooks and are interested in food, having a lifestyle based around a demand for good taste, modern knowledge, and health and well-being when it comes to food is important. And it takes time to do these things. It takes time. This weekend, we're going to go to uh, th this farm, and because I heard that they are selling whole sheep, and we want to maybe buy, or a whole lamb, rather. We want to buy a whole lamb and have it butchered and put it in our freezer. So we're going to go out and meet those people who raise these lambs and learn about their products and there's a connection there. There's a community that forms there. And we need to take time to do that. Number five, to promote Nordic products and Nordic producers and to disseminate the knowledge of the cultures behind them. We could substitute Oregon or... Northwestern products, okay, um, or regional products, okay, for anywhere this could apply to. Okay, so I was just talking about lamb. Um, let's talk about um, some other producers that maybe... Um, some farms, some wineries, okay, some, the list goes on and on and on, and I don't have time, honestly. Okay, this creates a sustainable economy. If we start to visit these places and spend our, our dollars on local products and support what these people are doing, then it comes back to us. Okay. We gain a cultural heritage. That's why you are, are all here, because of a Scandinavian cultural heritage. That's what brings us all together tonight. I'm proud of my background and my cultural heritage, but I live in Oregon. And I've gained an uh, Oregonian cultural heritage. It exists Oh, what do I do? And so, there we go. I'm shuttling back. Um, we get, so we start to get envy, and we, and we talk to our friends, and they go, hey, I went to this winery, and so, oh my God, where did you get that? Where did you get that product? Where did uh, Chef Aaron get those crackers? that all that forage stuff was put on. Well, they made them. Um, right? And sometimes you can't, you can't obtain something. It's like, well, I didn't buy it. I made it. 
And that's the best kind of answer, right? That's the best kind of answer to give somebody. Where did, where did you buy that? Nowhere. I'm, I made it. Number six, to promote the welfare of the animals and a sound production in the sea and in the cultivated as well as wild landscapes. So, yeah. Taking care of our world. Taking care of our world. Taking care of our ocean when we visit it. Leave it better than when we showed up. That forest out there. Going tromp, tromp, tromping around foraging for huckleberries or mushrooms. Okay? We want to leave it better than we found it. Preservation of natural resources. Duh. I mean, it really is a no-brainer. And um, like I said before, I come from Bend, and we have these wonderful mountain peaks down there. I say down because it's south. Um, and in the summer people like to hike to the top of these peaks. And there's one called, there's one called South Sister. It's in the, the sisters, the South, Middle, and North Sister. South Sister, hiking up there these days, it's like a highway. And I went up there this last summer, and there was garbage strewn around the forest. And I just spent a couple hours just picking up garbage and it broke my heart. So we need to leave it, leave our place better than we find it. Number seven, to develop new possible applications of traditional Nordic food products. This to me is the quintessence of new Nordic cuisine. Developing new possible applications of traditional Nordic food products. So using these wonderful things, Rene Redzepi is going to take, you know, some bug that he found in um, Copenhagen and he's going to freeze dry it and then rotovap it and then sous vide it and then put it on a plate. I'm really kidding. I don't know if he does that. But I know that um, he uses some of those techniques. He uses a lot of fermentation, um, new techniques that have to do with traditional techniques or expedite those results, okay? He can dry something out just like that, where when traditionally we would have to take the rye, grind the rye, make the flour, and make the kanaka brut and dry it out and then store it in our rafters for a couple seasons before we could eat it, okay? But they can make that in a second. They can utilize these new applications. They can take French techniques. They can take Asian techniques. They can take Latin American cooking techniques and apply them to Scandinavian Nordic food products. So the Nordic Food Lab, Noma, okay, the, the name Noma, okay, okay is uh, a hyphenated name, Nordic, N-O, and Ma, for mad, food, uh, in Danish, Noma. So the Nordic Food Lab is really where Noma's going. Who, who heard that Noma is closing? Yeah, that was big news this last week. And I wasn't planning on talking about it tonight. And then I said, well, geez, I've got I've to say something. But they're devoting all of their resources to the development of new products. When I was uh, cooking at the White House, um, there was this other chef. He was Scottish. His name was Ben Reed. And his job was working at Noma where... He was in charge of procuring all of 
these strange ingredients from around the world that were edible. Bugs, dirt, snakes, venom from snakes, all kinds of things. And um, he was an interesting character. And he said, you wouldn't believe what is going on there when it comes to this type of product development. Taking all of these edible things, the future of food in Mexico, the chipilinas, the, the grasshopper, or the crickets rather, that are fried and uh, tossed in chili powder and you eat them when you're, when you're having a drink of mezcal or something like that. That is the future of protein and that's where uh, Noma is, is starting to go. Okay, uh, lots of fermented foods. Modern preparation and cooking techniques that we will soon have in our kitchen because of what's going on there. Number eight, to combine the best Nordic cooking procedures and culinary traditions with impulses from outside. Impulses from outside. So taking something like um, collard greens and cooking them with uh, some smoked piece of fish, okay? Some smoked eel from the North Sea instead of the traditional smoked pork. Okay, taking, um, making risogrut out of uh, the rice that I would use for, for uh, Jaffa rice, okay, African rice. There are no rules. We can take things from all around the world and apply them in Nordic cuisine. The procurement of, of these foods. I was at I was at H Mart earlier today. We cruised into town and went to H Mart. And everything that was going through my head was Nordic cuisine. And I was looking at all of these Asian uh, ingredients, thinking, okay, how can this be applied? And I was in the kimchi aisle. Yeah. And I was like, how can I make a Nordic style kimchi. And all of these things went through my head and I'm gonna do it. I'm going, I am gonna take some Napa cabbage and I'm going to use some horseradish and some beet. I'm not gonna season it with, I'm not gonna make it very spicy, but that lacto fermentation that it takes to get there, I'm gonna take some um, anchovies and I'm gonna use that to start that out. And I'm gonna take some other dried fish to, to, to really get it rocking and get it fermenting. Using new ingredients. How many of you have gone into your farmer's market or grocery store and seen something that you've never used before and bought it? There's a few hands going up. Okay, right? Be curious, not judgmental. Okay, right? Just be curious and get something and try it out. I don't know what this is. I have never seen this before. Chances are that's going to be the, mo the least expensive thing that you buy because nobody knows what it is. So get it. And, that's, and, and that takes time. And it's, yeah, it's worth it. Okay, ingredients from around the globe. Find out what they, these new ingredients that you find are and how history plays into them. Not just with Nordic cuisine, but with any type of cuisine.
to combine local self-sufficiency with regional exchange of high quality goods. So uh, when I was a kid, I, uh, my, pa my parents were really into the Sons of Norway. And I went to uh, uh, Sons of Norway language heritage camp. And <clears throat> I learned this song, this folk song. Some of you might know it. it's Norwegian. Pardon my rusty Norwegian. Okay. Per spillman hon hon e ye ye naste ku. Per spillman hon hon e ye ye naste ku. On bit por ku ak fik fil a yen. On bit por ku ak fik fil a yen. Du gamble go a fiddlin du fiddlin du fil a mi. I'm amazed I remember that. It's just stuck with me. So it is about this man, Per Spillman, who plays fiddle. And he, he loves his fiddle, but he needs to feed his family. And he trades the fiddle for a cow so he can have milk and then later have meat for his family. And he is just in despair because he misses playing his fiddle, and he misses the music that it provides. So he ends up trading his fiddle back, or the cow back for the fiddle. And um, the point of this, of me bringing this up, is not only just to get to sing for you, but um, is finding a way to have both of those things in our lives. Finding a way to have all the things that we love, okay? And having community, having each other, having places like this where we can share ideas and go, oh yeah, I've got some of that, I'll bring it to you. And we can have it and then we can share, okay? I've got, I've got a fiddle you can play and you can keep your cap. And, we, and in that process, we can educate each other how to do these things. I'll teach you how to make Scandinavian kimchi if you teach me how to weave a table runner, okay? I love those types of trades. That's better than paying cash for anything, okay? And it's the type of economy that is the best type of economy. Number 10, to cooperate with representatives of consumers, other cooking craftsmen, agriculture, fishing industry, food industry, retail and wholesale industry, researchers, teachers, politicians, and authorities on this joint project to the benefit and advantage of all in the Nordic countries. Whew. You know, I think that they really wanted to make it 15 uh, points. And... Um, they said, no, we got to make it 10. So we got to cram like five points into the 10th one. All right, Rene, let's do it. Um, so this is where we get support, okay? This is where we can teach people about this and th where things become so important that we have the backing of our politicians, okay? Um, that's what I get out of this. And, and, you know, we have to leverage the importance of our local resources. And that's where things like, hey, I'm keeping the forest clean when I go out and forage for mushrooms so you could still allow us to go and do that instead of closing it off because there's trash on the trail to South Sister. Please don't do that, okay? Let us go to visit the ocean and dig for clams, okay? And our politicians can help us 
with all of that if we approach them in a sane and educated way. How do I adopt these philosophies and principles? I've been talking a lot about that already. How do I adopt these experiences? We do them. How do I adopt these philosophies and principles? Just start doing things. Start curing your own salmon. Talk to these guys at Broder. They'll help you out. Find a great source for salmon or whatever it is. Whatever you have an interest in, whether it's Nordic cuisine or any type of cuisine, look into it. Find someone who can teach you how to do it. We never have enough friends. Go to restaurants. Go to restaurants. If it's Nordic cuisine you're interesting, interested in, we have Broder here. We've got Maurice in, uh, in Portland. Okay, We've got um, Chef Lee Eric Benson at uh, Timberline Lodge. We've got Chef John Nelson out in Pacific City. So many. The list goes on and on and on. Get out in nature, even if you're not looking for anything particular. Driving out here today, just getting out of Bend. I know Bend is beautiful, but no matter where you live, you've got to get out of it for a little while. We were driving, and about 20 minutes into our drive, my friend Thomas goes, look, there's a bald eagle, and it was right over the road. It was just absolutely beautiful, and the mountains were right there. And I know we were in a car, but get out, get outside and just walk around and enjoy it. Get to where there are no other human beings and get out there. Breathe it in. Education, educate yourself about how to do the things you want to do. Take the time to do that and find the community that you can do that it with. Do things that make you happy. How can all this make my life better? Back to Nord Nordic neurotransmitters. The joy of something from nothing. I had an idea. And instead of just taking your crazy idea or maybe not so crazy idea and just thinking, oh, that was just an idea, Write it down and do it. Write it down and do it. Okay, this is sustainable. Okay, it, uh, whether it's with your family or with your community or both. Make your worlds collide. Oh, there's this group of friends and there's this group of friends over here, right? Sometimes we have those. We, oh, I've got my work friends and I've got my other friends that I hang out with on the weekends. Mash them up. Because you don't know what's going to happen. And suddenly, cool things do. And oh my gosh, those are the moments that we love. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thor. That was really great. Um, now we have some time, about 15 minutes, uh, for questions from the audience. Um, we have some online people who might be asking questions, but we're going to start with our um, in-person people. Before we do that, I just want to plug our next Friday night lecture, which is February 3rd, and it is all about Norway's path to winter sports success. Um, we're going to have a really, really great lecture, and we're really excited to, to hear about all of the success that Norway has 
with its sports and how it got there. Um, we have Sonia back here. She has a microphone. Does anyone have any questions for Thor? <clears throat> Perhaps you explained it, and just I just didn't get it. What is the significance of Nordic neurotransmitters? What is the significance of neuro, Nordic neurotransmitters? It's getting so into something, and Nordic neurotransmitters, it could be anything with neurotransmitters following it, okay? I use that because I get so excited about Nordic anything that it starts to fill my mind with joy, okay? Suddenly chemicals are running through my brain right at this very second that make me feel great just by talking about it, talking to you about this. So fill in the blank neurotransmitters, okay? Hi, Thor. I Hi. was just wondering, uh, who is one of your biggest inspirations currently right now in, in New Nordic Cuisine? Who are one of my inspirations, who are my inspirations right now in New Nordic Cuisine? Um, or Nordic Cuisine in general? Can I use that? Um, this kid right here, it's my son Jan. He inspires me every day to be better at everything. And here, uh, this is uh, right, um, gosh, it's on the Baltic. We had this, uh, we were staying in a stuga in the north of Sweden um, on the Baltic Sea, and um, we prepared that piece of fish on an open fire outside. Um, it was a really cool experience. So there's, so there's him and um, my father. My father, Ron Erickson, who taught me and inspired me in more ways than I can talk about. What's up? Oh, uh, I'm wondering like, if you want to use kimchi uh, in today's appetizer, how would you use it? Thank you. Uh, so just... Uh, the question was, if I wanted to use kimchi in one of tonight's appetizers, how would I use it? Um, I would use it on one of those wonderful Kumamoto oysters. And if I was going to take the Nordic cuisine approach to that, and I'm just making this up right now, I would maybe blend that, pulverize it into maybe a juice, and so it would be like a vinaigrette that I would drizzle on those oysters and have it like that. Two simple ingredients. With that question, since we live in a world with information overload and the internet and TV and just all these different sources of information, how do we merge getting inspiration from other cultures without taking that and overstepping? That is a question for the ages right now in this particular place and time that we live in. How do you not overstep your bounds when you want to learn and cook a cuisine that you, that is not associated with your own cultural heritage? But it's still delicious. But it's still delicious. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. And don't worry about that. I mean, the fact that the fact that we can, we have the ability to go procure all of these different ingredients from so many different cultures and go on the interwebs and find a recipe and be inspired to, to do that, okay? Um, that's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to have all these things at our fingertips, and it's it's hard sometimes to, uh, well, uh, I don't 
I don't even want to go there. I mean, don't worry about it. Just do it. Follow your inspiration. Follow your inspiration. And don't worry about the other thing. Don't worry about criticism or anything. I live in that world as a chef. I have all these great ideas, and we have to express our art. We have to express ourselves, right? Yes. I think. Oh, over there. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you want to Sonia's read? got the mic. Okay, so I'm just. Thank you so much, and I just wanted to say yes, experiment, because so much of what we have is from globalization and global cultures. So tea, salt, etc. So one of the things that I was really interested in is when you think of the manifesto that came out for New Nordic Cuisine, and there's a little bit of like modern sensibilities, and I think what's what we've learned over time is like these are really a return to traditional ways of doing things. Like lots of tribal communities, marginalized communities, they have been doing this a long time. Local food, local culture, local way of doing things. So I just, I'm always interested to see like how that might have changed. You know, I think it's wonderful that this manifesto came out and it really kind of was a return to a way people think of food traditionally. If it's not obvious, I work in climate change and ecosystem services. So I don't know how much it's evolved, you know, that understanding amongst chefs and others that, yes, it's modern, these focuses, but it's also a celebration of lots of different traditional cultures this idea that you're more tied directly to sustainability and to your local foods and your local culture. So any comments or thoughts on that would be wonderful. Well, thank you for bringing that up. It really is and has um, over the course of the last, um, gosh, that was 2004, so that's almost 20 years, 19 years, um, shed some light on different cultures, like the Sami culture in... Uh, northern Scandinavia, um, that food is really being celebrated now. And a lot of um, people who didn't know about that before are cooking that. And that's an inspiration for us here, where we can also look at our indigenous cultures here and start to learn what was here and what they were doing before we came along. Yeah, thank you for that question. Well, yeah, yes. Uh, we have a pretty rich area here regarding the salmon industry and the Chinook salmon, et cetera. Are you influ influenced by that in any way uh, but, but in, here in Oregon? It just seems to be that the Finns and the Nords really went after the fish industry here in the Astoria area. And uh, I utilize it a little bit, but I've only grilled a bit in salmon, not too much. Had a couple of experiences with it being done differently than uh, perhaps normal drying on a rack or smoking. Um, so are you, are you um, saying that, uh, talking about farmed Salmon from Scandinavia specifically? Absolutely Inter interesting. Um, we're trying to avoid uh, utilizing that because we're not too sure how much uh, organic or natural foods are coming out of that farming process. And uh, I don't want to push this button too hard, but uh, wild caught is being influenced and promoted a lot here in Oregon. Um, I work at it pretty hard occasionally. And I just uh, have not really used it too much in diet and wondered how you guys are preparing that, perhaps in your chef industry inside. So, yeah, that's a great question. What, you know, the labeling of seafood and other proteins can be deceiving. And suddenly there's something that we may not recognize and it's, it actually means something else. Um, when it comes to farmed salmon, I'm just going to go with farmed salmon specifically and just um, ask where you're buying it. Ask where it's farmed and what farm specifically it is and look that up. I mean, you know, we have the ability to in the in the, the store or where you where you buy your salmon. Look up that farm right there. If it's from 
Iowa, if it's farmed in Iowa, and I did see uh, a piece on the PBS NewsHour about a salmon farm in Iowa, okay? And it blew my mind, and I will never buy, I will never buy that salmon. Um, you know, there, uh, but there are some really good um, farm, there's some great farm salmon coming out of Norway. There's some great organic farm salmon coming out of Victoria, British Columbia. It's called organic salmon. I mean, that's what they call it, okay? And, and um, to look at their, their practices, it's, it's amazingly sustainable, and they don't feed them any crazy stuff, okay? But it's all about the research. But when it comes to wild-caught spring Chinook salmon from the Columbia River, um, there's nothing better, in my opinion. I mean, if you can get your hands on that wild salmon from the Columbia River, pink salmon with the, with the black mouth, good stuff, the best. Okay, our last question okay. will come from online. And someone is asking about ways that you can prepare reindeer. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just go, go down my little story uh, thing here. I, um, so we live in, in Oregon where there's a lot of venison being hunted, a lot of elk. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of us have eaten venison or elk in some way. Okay. If, you, if you've traveled to, to Scandinavia, more than likely you've eaten reindeer. In, in some way. I, I arrived uh, at Norway for the first time. I took, I took this horrible ferry uh, ride from um, uh, the, the, the north of Denmark to Christiansund, the south of Norway. And um, I was so happy to be on land again after that uh, trip um, that I, I was so happy that I bought the $20 beer and this reindeer filet. And it was absolutely de delicious. It was it was the backstrap of the the reindeer. Um, and so as I traveled more around Norway and then went up into the north of Sw north of Sweden above the Arctic Circle, there were actually reindeer running down the road. And uh, we stopped at this restaurant, and they they had nothing but reindeer burgers, and it was absolutely delicious. And my son. Uh, s still thinks that that is the best thing he's ever eaten, is a reindeer burger. Of all things, how would we prepare a reindeer? Oh, I'll make a burger out of it. Yeah. Um, so to further answer your question, any sort of lean meat application, just like filet mignon or something like that, where it doesn't have a lot of fat, you want to put flavor around it or a very flavorful sauce around it that... Um, helps it out, gives it a little bit of fat to lift it up, some acid, maybe some fruit is nice with that too. So, okay, thank you, Thor. All I wanted right. to get that in because I knew I that you were talking talk about it before. I could just talk for a long time about food. I just that's great, and uh, that's why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, so much for coming. We really appreciate it, and we will see you next month for our next Friday night lecture. Thank you. <laughs>